Hi. What are you doing? I'm uh, trying to decide where to hang this sweet Warhammer artwork. Huh. Feels like there's something more you want to say there, Daryl. No, I was just thinking that uh, what this room might need is like some neon beer signs and uh, maybe a motivational poster where there's them kitty cats and they're like uh, hanging from a, a, a clothesline and then like another poster with like a hot chick with like a machine gun. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'll uh, get right on that. Interior design by Daryl. Got a good ring to it, huh? There's some pretty amazing Warhammer outwork out there, and whether or not you enjoy the games or the lore, <clears throat> you can't deny that Games Workshop values the creation of amazing works of art that fall within their gaming universe. And when the new Soul Blight Grave Lords book came out, I was just blown away by this art cover. So much so that I went out of my way to purchase a print of the art itself. I mean, I'm a massive vampire and undead nerd, so easy sell. And very early on after I saw this artwork, I thought how cool would it be to create a miniature diorama representing this artwork. But of course, it's one of those big ideas we have and we keep putting off on the shelf and we never get around to it. But today is the day we stop procrastinating and I am going to attempt to recreate this artwork in miniature. And I have very, very little confidence that I'm going to be able to pull it off. Because I'm not really sure to where to begin, it seems the best place of any is the focus of the art, which is that vampire lord right on the cover. Luckily for us, Games Workshop does make this exact model. Well, almost. The pose on the model isn't exactly the same as the artwork, specifically her shield arm. If you see on the artwork, it is pointing straight down, but in the model, it's in an L shape. So we're going to need to break that arm off and we're going to put it back together using sprue goo. We can use this sprue goo to actually form the bicep back again and make it look like it was meant to be sculpted in this way. If you want a full breakdown on what sprue goo is and how to make your own, check out the video in the top right corner of your screen to get the full breakdown. The other area of difference is the face. On the artwork, we have a very gaunt, almost expressionless face of a vampire. Meanwhile, on the model itself, we've got that typical vampire scowl with the fang showing and this ridiculously wild bat-filled hair. No one's gonna take this shit seriously, so we need to get rid of this head entirely. I look through a bunch of other vampire kits that I have and pick up a box of blood knights to check their heads as well. And while there's nothing specifically that looks just like the vampire on the box art, I do find some options that I'm much happier with. Unfortunately, I can't find a single Games Workshop vampire that has their mouth closed. I guess that kind of makes sense. People aren't going to really even know it's a vampire if they can't see the fangs. So mouth open all the time. About now I'm realizing that I'm just focusing on these micro details of this whole scene, but it is in fact a whole scene. And so I think I need to get started on building up the base and creating that environment where the diorama will take place. I bought this base by Tarot Model Maker about a year ago with this exact piece in mind. It feels large enough to show a scene with multiple figures on it, but it's not so massive that your eyes are just lost in what to look at and you're never really finding what makes the piece interesting to begin with. Quick tip, whenever you're working with any kind of display base that you don't want to get all messed up through your creation and painting process, just use a bit of painter's tape and keep that all around the edge of the piece. That way when you're all done, you can just peel that off and you have that nice crisp plinth finish. I'm only using a few basic tools and supplies to build up the foundation of this natural environment some wax carving tools and clay shapers, some bark chunks that are used for landscaping in our yards, some super glue, and some milliput. Prior to this build stage, I actually took the bark chunks and threw them in my oven at about 150 degrees for 30-ish minutes. This way, we kill out any little bugs that might be living in there, and we also dry out that bark entirely, so we're not going to have any issues with adhering with the super glue. When I sit down to start to build this, I realized the artwork doesn't actually show what the ground looks like at all. The only bit of information that we have is that our main vampire is obviously higher up on the scene, standing on some bit of elevated ground. So we need to create what looks like some kind of a cliff or higher face where she is standing. 
And one piece of bark really spoke to me here. It's got the curve that matches the nice curve along the base, and it has a cool craggy texture on that side that will look like nice exposed rock for the finished piece. And I didn't quite realize it, but this really is the snowball moment. You just need to find one spark of inspiration, some little thing that gets you moving, because otherwise you've got all these details you're trying to figure out and you don't know where to begin. So for me, this one piece of bark got me moving and got me building. From here, we're gonna to need to create a natural slope with that point that the vampire is standing on being the peak. It will look odd if it's just one big piece of bark and everything else is flat. So we need to do some terraforming to create irregular organic change in elevation. And these kinds of steps are actually pretty difficult, especially if you don't do them often because they use a different part of our brain than we use for miniature painting. It's not just look at a surface, figure out what color you wanna paint that surface and then paint it. We're literally working with nothing and we need to create it up. But it actually gives me a different sense of satisfaction than painting a model does too. So it kind of works out. One thing I found that was really helpful for me throughout this process was to every so often go back in and place the main figure or main couple of figures whereabouts I think they should go. Sometimes that'll give me an idea of what it's missing or where I need to build up more rocky terrain here or make sure it's flat over here. Once I've got the bark placed where I want it, I come back through with some super glue thin and let that soak right into the bark. This really hardens it up so it's rock hard and I don't have to worry about breaking off bits of that bark as I'm building stuff in later steps. Also, this stuff makes an immediate bond, so be really careful you don't glue yourself to yourself. I'm still a ways away from really putting details into place on the base, but now is as good a time as any to take out some of the sweet basing bits from Epic Basing that I 3D printed and started looking for things that might go well and imagine where they might go. Just looking at things like broken cobblestones and rocks and gnarled tree roots and stumps and plant life can help you make a decision of what you envision for the piece. I decided to glue down a small tree right now. And I know you can't see any trees in the artwork, but I had a couple of reasons why I thought this was a good idea. First, the gnarled look, it just fits right in. And we need to create an atmosphere with more than just our models here. Next, height variation in dioramas are extremely important. You need to create drama. You need to create sight lines. Show them where the edges of the piece are. And finally, there are little flying bats all over the artwork. So I was kind of boggling my mind how I would get these flying bats to come through our art piece like this. Well, I need something to attach them to. And a gnarled tree limb is as good a thing as any. Next, we need to put our construction worker hat on and get our hands dirty and really making this feel like natural ground. Luckily, we're just working with putty and not actually concrete or other things that manly men really use to make real things in the big world. I'm using Milliput, but if you're using a lot of this kind of underlayment layers of building up clay, you could use something like an air drying DOS clay. It's much more economical. But this is what I had, and I had no idea how much of it I was gonna use, so I just got to work. The first step is to fill in any cracks and gaps between our bark and try to shape that clay to look somewhat similar in texture to the bark itself. This is about creating the illusion of a gradual change over the land form while not covering up too much of the bark so we still get that cool texture that looks like a craggy rock once the piece is fully complete. And then from here on out, I work towards the edges of the base. Some sections I want the drop off slow and gradual, and other areas I want to keep that steep rocky edge exposed. Today's video is brought to us by Space Wolf, an artist that really knows his way around some wood. And no, there's no relation to the Warhammer faction, but he does enjoy painting minis from time to time. They smell so good. He specializes in woodworking, illustration, laser engraving, and hand painting each work of art. Each piece is a limited run and is signed, branded, and numbered. What that means is when something sells out, it's gone forever as he destroys the original illustration in true metalhead fashion. So you know that your Space Wolf original is truly unique. He also carries these amazing painting kits and inside you've got everything you need to paint the amazing wood carving that's included. Except this one's upside down. It's a lot more dramatic if I say 
that's included. Look at these cute little baby paint bottles you get. I mean, that's priceless right there. Now I'm not done painting mine just yet, but I can tell you that so far it's been a ton of fun and it's really relaxing to work on. With the holidays just around the corner, why not pick up a truly impressive and high quality piece of art for someone in your life? Or, you know, even for yourself. I just love having these amazing works of art hanging up in my painting room. So be sure to check out Space Wolf on his Instagram to see what new crazy designs he's working on and then visit his website spacewolfltd.com to see everything he's got in stock before it's gone forever. And as a special bonus, use coupon code NINJAN at checkout for 10% off your order and free domestic shipping and reduced international shipping. So a big thank you to Space Wolf for sponsoring this video and sharing his amazing artwork and talent with all of us at the Ninjan family. While your clay is still soft and moldable, it's a good time to push in any of those 3D printed bits like rocks and rubble and terrain all right into that clay. You can then smooth out the transition so it looks like it's natural and it's not just a piece sticking on top of the clay. One really tough thing, but something we need to keep in mind when we're making this ground is that our models are standing naturally and they're not looking like they're tipping over. Specifically, the placement of this wolf in relation to the vampire is really important. So I'm creating an indent for two of his feet in the clay and later I'll be able to put him right back where I want him and he'll be perfectly level. Right about now, I realized it's been a good number of hours since I've gone back and tested where the vampire is on the scene and how well it looks. So I did that and I realized something. The more complex a scene is, and in my brain, this is actually a fairly complex scene, the harder it is to really know how well it's all going to come together when you're in the midst of it. It's making this decision-making process for me really difficult right now, and it's taking me much longer to build this stuff out than I thought it would. In hindsight, what I should have done is sketched up the whole scene based on how big this base is. I could draw in there where everything would be, how it would all line up, and I'd get all the sight lines and all the composition just the way I liked it before I ever started building, but it's too late for that now. And some of you probably already saw this stupid mistake coming, but I didn't. Uh, here is where I don't have all of the zombies and skeletons built that I'm going to use to fill out this whole scene. And instead of building them all and placing them where I think they should go, so I'm confident in the composition and in the next steps, I just decided to move on and do the finishing steps of the base before that. Laying down dirt or whatever ground cover you want to use should be one of the last steps we do before priming. And you'll see why in just a bit. But I did it now because I'm an idiot. So I just used some thinned down PVA glue and some dirt from my yard that I dried in the oven just like I did the bark earlier. I work in small batches so the glue doesn't start to dry before my dirt hits it. And then I tap off the extra dirt back into the tub so my entire painting area isn't covered in grit. Who am I kidding? It's everywhere. My painting desk is like a litter box right now. Minus the cat poop, I think. Once it's all had time to dry, I thin down my PVA glue with even more water so it's really thin and I dab it all over that dirt again. This seals it in and it creates a more uniform final texture that feels more to scale with the models we're using. And while that second layer of glue is drying, now I decide to go back through and find zombie and skeleton models that I want to use to fill out the scene. Like I said, I'm envisioning there'll be a horde shambling in from the back of the base, and they should have a more slumped, inactive pose, as opposed to the few models I'll have towards the front of the base. Those will have much more active poses, as if their opponents are right in front of them, just off scene. I just now started to tally up how many kits I bought that I didn't think I needed to make this diorama. And if you want to buy some Warhammer kits for your own diorama or for your own armies, the best place to do it, the cheapest place to do it, is Umbrella Games. You can use my link down below with an additional 5% off their already discounted prices and you support the channel. As well, I've got affiliate links down there for all the gear I used in this diorama base building stuff as well as the all the other stuff I used to paint models and that supports the channel as well. 
Oh, while I'm at it, I'm also taking the time to cut off all the stupid tree roots that these new zombie models have growing out of them. Okay, we gotta talk about this. This is so stupid, it makes no goddamn sense. If you are a zombie still in the state of decay where you still have skin and tissue and muscles and whatever, I can still see your human face, then you should not have been in the ground long enough for a three inch round diameter tree root to have grown all the way through your body and out your skull or out your rib cage. That is not how science works. That's not how fast trees grow. I'm sorry. Someone needed to say it. As I was building those models, I kept looking at the base and checking out that little spooky tree and I was happy that he was there. Happy little spooky tree that he is. And I thought maybe it would look better if he had some friends. So I printed out some more on my 3D printer, this time some bigger ones, and I placed them all around the back sides of the base just to see how they'd look. The back of the base, it really just kind of feels lacking. There isn't any height back there. There's no backdrop to our scene or anything that's really framing the front of the piece. It makes it feel like it's almost like floating and there's, there's a big lack of depth in general to the piece right now. Obviously the artwork doesn't suffer from this because you have this big awesome background with this big spooky castle, this ominous red sky, these bats and this zombie dragon flying from above. But I'm not gonna create this giant backdrop across the back of this piece and just kind of like kill the three dimensional aspect. So I'm gonna have to get creative. And here's where I just need to be okay with breaking away from the artwork and make this miniature version work regardless of the source material. I have to ask myself, would I rather have it look as close as possible to the artwork or look as cool as possible and then just hopefully still recognizable as influenced by that scene? And I fought myself back and forth on this for a while and try to think of other creative ideas and I'm sure you're probably screaming them at the screen right now as well, but I decided on the trees. I really think they add to the piece. I think it creates a good ambiance and, and it describes the scene better without taking away from the feel and draw that it is the same scene. And yeah, if I didn't put all that stupid dirt down already, I would have a much easier time gluing these trees in place and they'd probably fit more naturally. I also realized I didn't really like the position where I had put the wolf. He's crowding the vampire too much and he really just is hard to see from the ideal viewing angle of the piece. And that term, ideal viewing angle, is something that I didn't really think too much about prior to starting this piece, but I'm quickly learning how important it is. And sure, we can pick up a miniature and turn it 360 degrees in our hands and look at it from all angles. That's what makes miniature art so cool. But there still needs to be that ideal position where it looks best. Think of it this way. If you had to take a picture of your model from any angle you like, but that was the only picture that people could experience your model from, what would be the angle that it looks best? That is your ideal viewing angle. And that needs to help you make the decisions of where you place what and where you frame everything and which model lines up in those sight lines. And if I'd have been doing this from the beginning, I felt like the first like 10 hours of this build process would have gone much smoother. Now that I've emotionally come to grips with the fact that I have some giant spoopy trees in my piece, replicating an artwork that doesn't have spoopy trees, I can move forward to building the shambling horde that's coming from off scene right through up behind the vampire general that's leading them. And the footage you're seeing right now is the first time in this entire process that I'm actually feeling a little bit of confidence that this looks like a real miniature diorama. There was so much second guessing and I was just totally winging it and hoping for the best leading up to this point. And while I'm moderately happy with how it's looking, I'm still not sure it's right where I want it to be. I know I've got a few more details to add as well. Stuff like the flying bats coming off of the trees and, and wherever else I'm gonna put them. I'd like to add maybe a few more bits of dying shrubberies and maybe raise the rocks that the vampire is standing on just a bit so she's a little bit higher and stands out. I've learned so much from this process and I don't know if it'll really show in the video that this was a ton of work and took me way longer than I thought it would to really compose something that I was moderately happy with. And like I said, I'm not even 100% of the way done, but I am planning on building and painting this for a competition. So if I'm gonna do it, 
I don't want to rush through for you guys to see something that I'm not 100% happy with. I'd rather show you the 90% done version and then you can try it yourself. You know, I really didn't come into this project thinking that this was going to be like a multi-part series. Now, don't get me wrong. I'd never expected to have this whole thing painted in time either, but I don't know. If this is something you want to see the further steps of, of seeing this thing all the way to completion, let me know. I don't know if you'd like that or not. Put that down in the comment section below. And if you do like it or like the video in general, make sure you hit the like button so other people can find it and decide if they want me to continue this journey and have you along for the ride. Speaking of along for the ride, if you wanted to support me in making more videos like this, the number one way you can do that is to check out my Ninjon Patreon link down in the video description below. You get to see the bunch of cool rewards you get for just a couple of bucks a month, and you get to see my weekly vlog series, as well as get some great advice from the awesome Ninjon painting community. Now I'm going to see you back here again real soon, and sometime between now and then, make sure you find time in your day to slay the gray. You know, maybe, maybe like a lamp. That's also a, a fake leg. You know, maybe some like Christmas lights. You just keep up all year long. You know what I mean? I feel like there needs to be more accent piece ashtrays here. What if there was like a lounging waterbed or like a waterbed couch? that you could also lounge in.